we are ready to start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, City Club. We are really excited to have this event uh, tonight. Um, my, I am delighted to welcome you to the City Club uh, City Club uh, sponsored panel discussion about Penn Station. My name is Leila Logiziko. I am the president of the City Club. The City Club is a civic organization founded in 1892 as a good government and sound planning civic group committed to working for all New Yorkers. But first tonight, I want to acknowledge the passing of a great New Yorker. Lieutenant Governor Dick Ravitch was a giant. And when we think of the MTA, which we're going to talk a lot about tonight, we owe Dick Ravitch an enormous debt of gratitude. And it's a debt that we don't need to bond. It's a debt that we own in our hearts and that we will repay by being inspired by his actions. When we think of our good government principles, we also owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, he, I was fortunate to have met him. He actually advised me on this very topic we will be discussing tonight, Penn Station. He had strong opinions about the topic and was not afraid to harshly criticize the governor's plan to build 10 super tall towers around Penn Station. He did so last year in a uh, very, very powerful op-ed that was published in the New York Daily News. I was also very fortunate to share the stage at a Cranes Forum bref uh, breakfast forum with Dick Ravitch this past December and his insight kept kept everybody in the room on their toes, and he will be terribly, terribly missed. Tonight, we are together to talk about a very important topic for our city and our entire region, Penn Station. Uh, this event comes on the heels of a previous event that the City Club held on Madison Square Garden, which had lots of implications and ramifications uh, on Penn Station. And uh, we received actually a lot of uh, requests and emails and questions about holding and uh, hosting an event about uh, the station itself. So here we are tonight, and I'm delighted to be joined by a great panel of experts. Uh, we are joined by Richard Emery, who is a uh, civil rights and land use attorney. He's also a member of uh, the City Club, has been a member for many years. Uh, Rachel Foss is a senior policy uh, director with Reinvent Albany, a good government advocacy group that has done a lot of work on Penn Station. And Felicia Park Rogers, who is the director of regional infrastructure projects at Tri-State Transportation Campaign, an advocacy group that focuses on transportation in the Northeast region. But before we jump into our discussion, let me give you a brief overview of the issue at hand, which will help orient viewers. So let me share my screen. Um, and okay, here we are. So Penn Station, we know where it's located, uh, bounded by 8th Avenue and 7th Avenue, uh, 33rd and 31st Streets. Uh, but before we talk about the future, uh, let's talk quickly uh, about the past. Uh, once upon a time, Penn Station had, had a grand presence. This is the Mickey Mead and White uh, building that was, uh, that, that was built in 1910. Uh, the station uh, was built by Mickey Mead and White uh, in the Beaux-Arts style. It opened on September 8th, uh, 1910, and it was a new station that was hailed as a marvel of engineering and architecture. Um, the station was demolished in 1963. Uh, Pennsylvania Railroad sold Penn Station uh, to cut losses from declining passenger train service. The rise of automobile and air travel reduced train ridership, making upkeep of the grand but underused station too costly. Uh, Madison Square Garden buried Penn Station. So the land above Penn Station uh, was repurposed uh, for the arena and an office complex that we know today as Two Penn. Uh, the losing of uh, past actually robbed Penn Station of its future. The demolition spurred the city's first modern preservation policy. And after the original Penn Station demolition, the current underground station was built. An all too common site at Penn Station, uh, the overcrowding, but actually starting in the uh, 1980s, uh, the, the trend of ridership uh, totally shifted. 
while it was assumed in the 60s that ridership uh, had declined, uh, actually it started to increase again. And by 2000, the station was serving over 600,000 commuters daily, making it the busiest uh, uh, train hub in the Western Hemisphere, which is still the case today, even, even uh, post-pandemic. Uh, for a, uh, an, an idea of scale, this represents uh, three times uh, the, uh, the traffic that goes through uh, JFK uh, airports. Uh, Penn Station today is a cramped and crowded space with dark corridors lacking the grandeur of its past. Penn Station's platforms are narrow and often congested. This is a site that I'm sure you've all experienced. It is cramped, it is dangerous, and it does not meet uh, the, uh, the fire code for uh, egress uh, in, uh, at the platform level. Uh, but beyond being a train station, it is also the heart of a rail network. Uh, the Northeast Corridor uh, is a 457-mile uh, rail route operated by Amtrak that connects Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. Uh, the Northeast Corridor uh, supports a 2.6 trillion economy. So it is uh, very, very critical for uh, the region and for the nation. Uh, the regional commuter uh, net network around New York is operated by Long Island Railroad, New Jersey Transit, and Metro North. Major towns served uh, include Stamford, New, New, New Haven, Trenton, Philadelphia, and Ronkonkoma. Uh, combined, uh, they serve over 800,000 commuters daily and span over 1,700 miles uh, of tracks. And as you can see on this map, uh, New Jersey Transit actually uh, carries the largest number of stations and is currently experiencing the largest housing uh, growth. Uh, what's interesting to note is that 75% of ridership ends up at Penn Station. So you can see that you know, the, the region moves lots of people, but they all actually converge uh, into Penn Station while they use Penn Station as a connector to then go on to uh, the, their final uh, destinations. Uh, so let's talk about the Penn Station projects. Lots of things are happening and uh, which is why we felt it was important to organize this event. So we have the Hudson Tunnel Project. Uh, this is a uh, two-tube uh, new tunnel uh, construction that is going to go under the Hudson River while at the same time, uh, the existing tunnels will be renovated after the damage that they uh, suffered during uh, Superstorm Sandy. Penn Station expansion, which is a capacity expansion project, uh, the preferred alternative we've been told, although the environmental review has not started, is an expansion to the south, which has raised a lot of opposition. Uh, but Amtrak, uh, which is a lead on this project, is telling us that uh, other alternatives will be uh, evaluated. Penn Station reconstruction, which is a reconstruction of the existing uh, train station. Uh, this has been the focus of a lot of attention uh, lately, uh, including with the uh, press conference uh, given by the, uh, the governor uh, a couple of days ago, as well as a uh, proposal for the reconstruction that was unveiled today uh, by an Italian uh, design and uh, engineering uh, firm. And Penn Access is a project that is currently underway that is going to connect uh, Westchester and the Bronx uh, into Penn Station directly. Um, so uh, let's go a little bit deeper in details. Uh, the Hudson Tunnel Project, as you can see, uh, an existing tunnel and then uh, a, a new tunnel that will have actually two tubes uh, doubling, possibly doubling the capacity, although that is also the subject of uh, you know, great uh, controversy. Um, the expansion, uh, which originally was presented uh, as a southern expansion, uh, now it seems that Amtrak is conceding that there will be other alternatives uh, evaluated. Um, the, uh, the, so that's the proposed pen expansion, as you can see uh, on these, uh, you know, outlined in black, uh, all these buildings would be uh, demolished. Uh, the proposed uh, Penn Station expansion would cost $12 billion. This is according to Amtrak. 
Um, then we have the proposed Penn Station reconstruction. Uh, this is a rendering from uh, the, uh, the design that has been uh, proposed by MTA. Uh, as per uh, MTA uh, estimate, Penn Station reconstruction will cost $7 billion. Um, and then there is an alternative uh, proposal uh, by a uh, private company, uh, engineering uh, and uh, uh, operating company, ASTM, uh, the branch of an Italian uh, company that uh, man manages and uh, operates uh, roads, bridges, and uh, railroads uh, in Europe, as well as in Brazil and North America. Uh, the proposed Penn Station reconstruction, as per ASTM, is uh, $6 billion. Um, and uh, MSG is a big component of uh, this, uh, th this whole block. Um, so what does MSG have to do directly with Penn Station? So here is a little uh, cost estimate. The estimated cost of moving MSG and reconstructing Penn Station uh, would be $8.5 billion. Uh, there is no design attached to this reconstruction as this has not been really uh, further explored, but this is going to be an interesting uh, uh, data point to keep in mind as we discuss the future and the opportunities for, for this block. So, you know, once again, just to, to recap, um, ASTM uh, is proposing a reconstruction of PAN for 6 billion and uh, Madison Square Garden gets to stay where it is. Um, MTA reconstructs PAN for 7 billion and uh, MSG gets to stay where it is. And the cost to actually move MSG and reconstruct PEN is 8.5 billion. So, you know, we're going from six to seven to 8.5. So very quickly, Penn Access uh, is a, a, a new uh, commuter rail line uh, with uh, four new train, uh, train stations uh, that would uh, go from Westchester through the Bronx and directly uh, into Penn Station. It is currently under construction and slated to open in 2027. Uh, related projects are the uh, Penn Station General Project Plan that has been referred as the GPP General Project Plan. Uh, this has been uh, the highly controversial plan uh, introduced by Governor Cuomo back in 2020. Uh, it is uh, under the, uh, the, the, the uh, sponsorship of ESD, uh, Empire State Development Corporation, which is the economic arm of the state of New York. Uh, and another related project is Madison Square Garden. Uh, so the general project plan, GPP, uh, this is the footprint of, uh, of this project, uh, a highly, highly dense uh, proposal that would cause the uh, demolition of six city blocks uh, around Penn Station and the construction of 18 million square feet of new office space, mostly office space with a little bit of hotel, a little bit of residential, a tiny sprinkle of uh, affordable housing for uh, good measure. Uh, Madison Square Garden, why uh, does it matter at this particular juncture? Uh, because there is currently a special operating permit uh, that is issued by uh, the city of New York uh, that is required for Madison Square Garden to operate as an arena with a capacity over uh, 2,500 uh, 2, uh, patrons. Um, this uh, special permit will be voted on by the City Planning Commission on July 12th. And then the city council will take the final vote uh, sometime in late August or early September. Uh, so the challenges with the uh, current Penn Station, capacity and growth limitations, delayed investments and improvements, lack of regional uh, rail connection, risk of neighborhood destruction, lack of regional planning and uncertain funding. So all good topics that we're gonna be uh, talking about tonight. Um, so, you know, the, the, the goals for the region and the neighborhood, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to talk about all of that, but I think that, you know, emphasizing uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, improving public realm, uh, remaining competitive for, uh, for the region, uh, promoting uh, greenhouse gas reduction and climate resiliency are uh, topics that, uh, you know, are of uh, great importance and, you know, totally connected to, uh, to Penn. Um, so we're going to be talking about the operations at Penn Station and, and through the region, 
the funding mechanisms and the impacts to our neighborhood or in our community. When you ask people what Penn Station looks like, what is Penn Station? People usually think about a building, but Penn Station is actually really the heart of a network. And uh, this is really the critical part uh, that, you know, until we get that part right, it's going to be hard to figure out what the building should look like. Um, so we're not going to talk too much about architecture today, uh, but really we're going to be focusing on, uh, you know, the environmental impact and and uh, economic, fiscal, and uh, operational infrastructure uh, needs of, uh, of our region. So uh, I am very pleased once again to uh, introduce uh, our panel, uh, Richard Emery, uh, attorney, Felicia Brooke Rogers, uh, policy uh, expert uh, with Tri-State Transportation Campaign, and Rachel Falls, mm -hmm. policy director with uh, Rain Van Albany. Um, let's uh, stop the sharing of the screen and let's share a uh, good conversation. Good evening, everyone. Um, so we had a super busy week um, because on Monday, uh, which is like two days ago, uh, the governor actually uh, held a uh, fairly sudden uh, press conference. And uh, at this press conference, uh, she announced some things that I'm sure we're going to be talking about. I'm not quite sure what she announced. Um, if I try to recap, um, I think she announced that um, we are launching some design for, uh, for Penn Station. Um, and she also announced some decoupling of one project uh, against the, the other. And then today, uh, ASTM, Italian company, um, has actually unveiled uh, their proposal to reconstruct uh, Penn Station. But before we get into this little bit of sort of like hot news, let's take a little bit of a step back and uh, you know let, let let's take the the the, the broader uh, question. So Penn Station complicated. We know we get it. Uh, you know many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, what is currently being uh, being pushed? What are the different plans? And maybe I'm going to start with you, uh, Felicia. Um, we have uh, a reconstruction project, a uh, expansion project, uh, a uh, tunnel a resiliency and redundancy project, and then we have a uh, real estate project with towers. Is is that about right, or do we have even more stuff going on? Well, I, I think your presentation very well covered the, the myriad of different projects that are surrounding this. At the heart of the project is the goal, as you said, to increase our capacity and our regional connectivity so that passengers can move back and forth across the region um, more easily, more safely, and more efficiently. We need that for our economy, be it for commuting, for tourists, um, prior to COVID, we had 70 million people a year visiting New York City. We're already back to 60 million people a year. Many of them use transit in addition, of course, to our many uh, commuters and essential workers. The, the key goal and, and the key number in the presentation that you highlighted is that the station in 1963 was designed for 200,000 people a day, and we have 600,000 people a day. Those are coming through commuter rail systems and through the Northeast Corridor and Amtrak. Um, we don't have the safety in place that we need for that number of people in that small of a space. And we also do not have the track and platform capacity that we need. The tracks and platforms are from 110 years ago. Those are the 1910 tracks and platforms. They don't conform to modern technology or to modern safety standards or to accessibility. Uh, so to me, the primary question, when you look at Penn Station, and we often hear the MTA say, we wanna renovate from the ground up. I don't wanna renovate from the ground up. We must renovate from the track and platform up, which is a level below ground. Yeah, yeah, no, that, I think that that's very critical. And we're, we're gonna to touch on that uh, qu quite a bit in this conversation. Um, I want to turn the next question to you, uh, Richard. 
you've been uh, very involved uh, in uh, you know, the, the GPP, the general project plan, which is the real estate uh, deal that you know, surrounds uh, the, the Spen Station project. Can you actually tell us what this project has have to do with Penn Station, if if anything, uh, for that matter, which I think is a, a great part of the argument that uh, the, the litigation is making? Yeah, let me first say that I, I think your presentation of the baroque nature of this entire controversy is just marvelous, Leila. You, you really brought together in 10 minutes or 80 minutes or whatever it was, factors which uh, uh, capture a great deal of the enormous complexity of this entire mess. And the, I think the thing to, to uh, remember here, uh, before I answer your question, is that there are at least six major parties who have to agree to anything that happens. Uh, the city, um, you know, the, the city, the Amtrak, New Jer um, MTA, New Jersey Transit, uh, the state ESD, um, and there are others. I, I, you know, that that are in this mix. Uh, and the idea in this day and age, with the politics of New York, and the politics of New Jersey, and the politics of the federal government, all at play here, make this. Um, and Rachel knows a lot about this as well. Make this problem more than a Gordian knot. It's a. It's it's. It's a, a level of complexity which I certainly have not seen in my experience in litigating a lot of complicated real estate and other issues. To answer your question, this whole mess, well, it started long before the governor and Steve Roth from Bornado sat down one day, obviously, and I'm, I'm interpolating here. I don't have evidence that they actually did sit down, but I have no doubt that they did. And and um, Roth, uh, in his uh, long-term goal of making this the, the diamond in his uh, tiara um, for uh, of real estate development before the crash, before COVID, um, said to the governor, I want to build lots here. I want to build everything here. And the governor, in his inimitable way, and, and his desire to build everything everywhere, LaGuardia, Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, ever, everything everywhere he could, um, said, yeah, let's do it, right? What do you need? I'll give you anything you need. And basically, what he said, we'll use the excuse of paying for the station with the real estate taxes uh, that would be taxes. Now we know them as pilots, payments in lieu of taxes. And um, we'll bond the, the, the cost of the station and service the bonds by having this income stream for the next 40 or 50 years as you build and rent and lease this magnificent, uh, opulent new center. And they made a deal. And it was a deal where a station served real estate rather than the way we ordinarily think, ordinarily think of the logic of a transportation center serving, uh, being served by real estate. It was ass backwards. It was all upside down. It, 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 from its conception, it was ill-conceived. So um, our case challenges that essence, the essence of the ill-conceived genesis of this project and how arbitrary and capricious it is, capricious it is under the Article 78 standards. But more importantly, they they, the ESD overrode local zoning by in this GPP, which the zoning limited Roth, and that made his properties much less valuable than if the zoning was not in effect. So the essence of the GPP that the governor hung out there as a carrot for, for um, Roth and Bernardo was I'll give you 18, 000, 18 million more square feet of developable space, more 130% more than you get under zoning, without even going to the city or going through the review process, without going through any justification for this, without even knowing what that project could generate in the way of money, even if you could develop Penn Station with that money, and that's not at all clear. 
So, and, and in the context, in that context, we'll give you eminent domain over a great deal of this. We'll throw in a couple of other projects south of the station where the expansion has to happen, where gateway tunnels have to happen. And um, we'll make this a, um, a, 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 an ode to your father. We'll call it, you know, I, I don't know. That's, that's what uh, Andrew always wanted, things named after his father. But of course, Cuomo was name was on it. Anyway, so the genesis of this thing and the GPP is this unholy alliance of real estate and service of itself rather than a station and a station in service of real estate. Yeah, it's actually interesting because they, they try to sell it as value capture, as capturing the value of the development where, you know, it has appeared abundantly clear that it would be actually the development that would capture the value of a new train station. Um, so I, I want to turn it to, uh, to to Rachel because you've been looking at this issue really, really in depth for years now. And um so what was this whole thing and uh, what do we make of this uh, un un decoupling? And we, we actually have the video of, uh, of the governor, but may maybe Rachel, do, do you want to touch on that quickly? And then I would like to, uh, to play the, the, the video of uh, the governor's press conference uh, th this week. So what was this whole thing and why is it, I mean, we understand, you know, it's, it's a big project. It is going to be expensive. Uh, what was it totally? foolish to even imagine that you know the pilots payments in lieu of taxes were going to generate uh, any revenue for this project so thanks so much Layla for for having me in the city club and and I'm um, excited to be here with Felicia and Richard it's uh, a good conversation to keep having I have a feeling we're going to have this for years to come even though we've been uh, all discussing this for years already so you know, I think what's important to recognize about the GPP and how the projects was initially envisioned is it was going through economic development and land use processes, right? It was a land use proposal. It was a proposal to, as you said, generate revenue for a train construction, train hall construction, reconstruction, Penn Station. <laughs> I think finally we're getting to the point where the governor's talking about Penn Station. That's maybe a positive thing rather than development because the stated purpose of the GPP all along was to fund transit. But as it became more and more clear that that, how does this money work? Are we talking about magic money? Is this real money? We're not talking about bonding off of the state's personal income tax. That's pretty clear that that's gonna be a reliable revenue source. We were talking about speculative revenue that was gonna be coming over, mind you, being siphoned away from New York City for 80 years. And that's really important for folks to recognize that we were talking about development that was gonna occur over 80 years and have this paid back. That was truly an unprecedented proposal in terms of financing for, uh, projects that are usually done through municipal bonds, pretty straightforward processes. So it's clear that, you know, finally everyone's caught up that that magic money approach was not gonna work. So now we're left with the MTA actually having to pick up the pieces and figure out, okay, well, how are we gonna fund this? And we're starting to get to that logical conclusion of we should have been funding this through the state budget, through federal dollars, all along. So that I think is a significant part of what happened earlier this week. Though I will say the GPP is not dead. It's still alive. It's still a document that has been approved by the Empire State Development Corporation. But the MTA is progressing with their design. Um, yet we still don't actually have a final plan. It's not as if it's a capital project that is on their books for their capital plan. So um, that is the initial overview I'd give. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more. Um, so I, yeah, so I actually, um, you know, the, the, the governor gave this very sudden press conference. You know, this is something we did not expect because we did not realize that there was really anything to announce. And, you know, we've been following this thing pretty closely. And, you know, we're under the impression that, you know, everybody was hard at work. Great. And, you know, if anything, there's, yeah, Madison Square Garden and the special permit. But we didn't realize that there was really anything that was imminent. And yet the governor uh, and the, uh, the, the the chairman of, uh, of the MTA, Jan Lieber, uh, called a press conference uh, on, uh, on Monday morning. 
Uh, ironically, at the very same time, the City Planning Commission was holding a review session during which they were discussing a follow-up to the application by uh, Madison Square Garden to uh, a uh, special operating permit. And it was interesting to see the commissioners actually mention the press conference. And they had no clue that it was going to happen. So there was a little bit of lack of, of communication. But what was really striking with this press conference is that the announcement sounded exactly similar to the announcement that the governor made literally a year ago, almost to the date. Uh, in 2022, it was actually on July 9th. And uh, we actually have the video of both. Uh, so uh, before you do, before you go to that video, Leila, I think it's yes, worth noting, I think it's worth noting that the press conference was also two days before the ASTM press conference releasing their plan, which had gained a great deal of momentum from a number of public officials and others. Not that it is the best plan, but it is an interesting plan. And, it, and Jana Lieber had opposed it deeply. And somehow the governor, who was thought to be inclined in that direction for a while, has been now co-opted by Janet Lieber to undermine that plan and open the whole process up, as she said uh, yesterday, as she said on Monday. Yeah, yeah, no, de definitely. We're going to talk about the, the the timing of it all. Uh, so, if we can actually do a uh, a share screen and show this uh, video of the governor. So today. I'm very proud to announce a significant milestone in our progress. We are officially moving into the design phase of the new Penn Station, and we're going to start accepting proposals from architecture and engineering firms to guide the Penn Station reconstruction. And I said, tell me the timetable, and whatever it is, shave some time off it, uh, whatever we can within the law. <laughs> so today we're officially announcing the design process. For the new station has officially begun and we're happy to show some of the designs right now these are just concepts but to know that we're going to be open now to any architect any design firm any engineer to allow them the opportunity to compete for a position to perhaps be creating this world-class masterpiece so first video 2022 second video 2023 the really spooky part is that the governor is wearing the same jacket and the same shirt. It's Groundhog and, Day. It's Groundhog Day. And it's exactly. It's Groundhog Day mixed up with waiting for Godot. <laughs> are we are we in, in an alternate universe? Is there something totally dissonant? Or should we just jump to the conclusion that Richard has hinted before we watch this video that Maybe it had to do with another announcement that the governor and MTA were not so keen to, to listen to. Felicia, your thoughts. I, I, I did want to go back a second to something that R Richard said about the general project plan and the plan. Let's, 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 let's stick with this. As okay, okay. Just watch the, 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 the okay. video. We, we can come back to the... To okay, the I do want to clarify something about the plan later, but... Um, yeah, I mean, this is very confusing because there's, it, it is eerie that she's wearing the same suit and made the exact same um, announcement. And it also the MTA board already approved a design contract and picked a vendor. So um, the, while they haven't funded that and the design contract hasn't gone into motion, it's very confusing the announcement from Monday saying we're open to new designs and uh, we're throwing this open to hear from architects and engineer firms and, and welcoming new designs because they already picked a firm and they already approved a design contract. So I don't know if Rachel has more information about that. Um, and it, obviously, as Richard pointed out and you pointed out, the timing with the ASTM, which you know a year ago, none of us knew anything about that. They were still in progress and, and they've really come forward with, with some a, a new plan since then. Um, but it is all very fishy. So, 
Rachel, you, yeah. I know that you, you actually pointed out to me uh, earlier today that the MTA issued uh, a statement following the press conference. So it looks like it needed a little bit of clarification. Your thoughts? Yeah, so I agree. It was definitely uh, seeing those side by side is fascinating. Yeah. Um, the governor wants a victory. That is very clear. And, you know, that that is very clear. Uh, as far as the the uh, contract that the MTA approved with this is FX Collaborative and WSP, they're both major um, you know players in this space. Um, it's for preliminary design, and that's a term that's very confusing. And I think what um, the MTA tried to clarify in their statement after the governor's press conference is that you know. There's preliminary design work, and then there's going to be another bid for a design build or design, you know, other type of mechanism contract. Um, and we don't even have, as I mentioned earlier, an actual project in a capital plan yet, other than a design sort of placeholder in the 2020 plan right now. So this is all feeding into a, you know, at some point there's gonna to have to be a firm to do the work. And from what everything's been mentioned, it will be a firm that will do designing and building in some manner. Um, so it will be open. However, when a firm is doing the initial preliminary design, that certainly gives them a leg up to be the one to do the full contract work. Um, and I would just note on the different proposals, you know, we we're lacking financial plans from almost every aspect of this. The ESD didn't have a financial plan and the Public Authorities Control Board didn't even approve one. Um, the MTA hasn't released a financial plan because they're still in design. And ASTM's plan so far, there's been a press release, but I just checked their website to be a good person and make sure I didn't miss it. I don't see a financial plan for their $6 billion either. And you know that's a concession model where they would be having to um, they would be getting payments from the MTA and other parties. So it's all very confusing, but we're it very we're we're not very far along despite the announcements about design. We still have a ways to go. Yeah. Just to add to that, in your presentation, Layla, you mentioned the MTA plan is seven billion, but they have mentioned a range in the past. And the New York Times story on Monday also used that range of seven to ten billion. The number of seven billion is very much a back of the envelope calculation, if that even. Yeah. Well, Wait, well just I mean, remember. I, yeah, just Richard. Rem remember, Layla, that the East Side access at Grand Central was supposed to be three billion dollars. It ended up being thirteen billion dollars, and delayed by about four years. It is uh, the Second Avenue subway was the most expensive per mile in the history of any tunnel building of any transportation facility in the world. By far, it's like three times as, as expensive. So seven billion is, uh, is just a, a shot in the dark. Yeah, I, you know, the, to me, and I've said it before, the, this whole notion that A, you would do back of the envelope for that kind of project is just so silly. And it is really an insult to the back of the envelope. Uh, yeah. As we know that, you know, these 7 uh, billion are going to be way more uh, than, than that. Um, Richard, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, the governor saying something in 2022 and then saying exactly the same thing as if, you know, we were coming out of a total, you know, vacuum as if, you know, this was like a brand new project that we've never worked on. Uh, shouldn't we be done with the design? And ha how does that inform uh, your, uh, you know, appreciation of the litigation going forward? Well, uh, my reaction is as party to this, as, as lawyer for the litigants, the city club being one of the litigants, in this uh, uh, ongoing challenge to the GPP and to the FEIS, the, the uh, Environmental Impact Statement. Uh, and uh, it is very helpful. And it is very helpful to our litigation because the proof is in the pudding. We, the, from the beginning, we said that this was an arbitrary and capricious plan. It had no basis. It was, ba it, when it was presented to the ESD board members, they had no numbers in front of them. Uh, they, it was completely an, a, 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 an effort by Holly Liked at that point at ESD to rush this through because she had some 
wrong notion, some ill-conceived notion that it was necessary in order to get federal funding to have a state plan in place that could generate the state share of, of, the, of the project. The only sharing that's ever been agreed to is for, for Penn South, for Gateway, which is 25, 25 and feds, 25 for New Jersey, 25 for New York and 50% for uh, Amtrak for the federal government. The thing that's missing here that's so interesting and makes this entire thing just dreamlike is that Amtrak is deafening, deafeningly silent. And Amtrak is almost all the money. All the money, the sharing formula that's effective at Gateway is not at all clearly going to be effective for the rest of this project. It's not by any means clear. Amtrak is going to pay all the rent if ASTM, most of the rent, if ASTM is in fact the designer. Amtrak is going to service a lot of the bonds. It's going to put up the money to do the original, the original purchasing, and there'll be a sprinkling of money from the, the uh, from the United from the uh, New York State. So it's all backwards. Everything is hidden. Everything is behind the scenes. Everything is a moving target. Madison Square Garden is an entirely moving target, a big factor in the cost and a big factor in the design. The idea of letting a design project contract go out today, right, and in 2022, without knowing where Madison Square Garden is going to be, is an absurdity. How can you design something when you have no idea what the land is going to look like and what's going to be on top of it? So everything about this is from is a lack of leadership, a lack of vision, a lack of any kind of, um, of, of concept to get from A to Z. There's nobody who's thinking about this in linear terms. They're all thinking about it as positioning themselves politically and otherwise to take an opportunity that none of them can conceive of as actually being the interests of the, of the people, of the people of the city of New York and of the people who ride the trains. Yeah, so to, to stay a little bit longer on, on, on the numbers, um, MTA proposal, and we're gonna to try to stay you know, really apple to apple. So reconstruction of Penn Station. Uh, MTA is telling us a range that would go from uh, seven to 10 billion. Uh, ASTM is telling us 6 billion. Both projects keep MSG where it is. To ESD's own admission and their own computation, in a case where they were trying to actually make the case that it's not a good idea to move MSG, they come up with 8.5 billion to basically solve the entire conundrum moving MSG, acquiring the land, buying uh, alternate land for uh, the new arena to be built, demolishing uh, the arena and rebuilding Penn Station. Uh, so we're going from six to, let's be conservative, seven uh, to eight and a half, where you basically solve everything. Um, do we actually have the, the, you know, the, the case made in front of us? Like, let's do it or am I missing something? Uh, Rachel. Um, I think, as I said, these are all, all of it is back of the envelope. And I think as a uh, coming from a watchdog organization, you cannot be so casual with billions of taxpayer dollars. Um, the difference between six, seven, eight, ten. 10, we're talking about opportunity costs. It's, we don't live in an environment of unlimited resources. There's limited federal dollars to apply for. There's limited state dollars. The MTA is, as you all know, having financial difficulty. We cannot push this burden on them. So it's, I think the casualness that the numbers are being thrown around, not by all of us, is just really disheartening. And in, in from ESD was pure obfuscation. Um, that we really need, like you said, if we want to do true apples to apples, we need detailed financial plans from every party involved in order to make a sound, reasonable decision. And I know that um, we had asked the Independent Budget Office of the City of New York, um, along with CB5 and many others, for an analysis of ESD's plan. And they said they simply cannot perform a an analysis of the finances of ESD's proposal. 
And there's similarly a lack of detail for all of uh, the current information. We, we still can't do that. And I think until we can get there, then unfortunately, we just can't say what, what plan is better. Um, the MSG numbers come from a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I think that's not a financial plan either. Um, from parties who have vested interests in what happens to, to MSG or doesn't happen, right? Um, so, you know, I would love to have financial plans from all these parties and to ask the independent budget office to take a look and tell us what they think because they don't have a skin in this game. So yeah. that's my yeah. two cents, yeah. my two cents on the billions and billions of dollars at stake yeah. here. So um, I think that, that that's a, a, a perfect uh, follow-up for you, uh, Richard, because uh, you are actually involved in two litigations, uh, one of them that has to do with actually just getting simply access to the information. And uh, up until now, although maybe we have a little bit more thanks to the great work that you have been doing, uh, ESD is still refusing to produce a uh, Ernst & Young uh, you know, set of documentation on uh, what those numbers would be. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, we started making demands. Chuck Weinstock is co-counsel in this whole matter and has been very uh, instrumental in this. In fact, the the name on that lawsuit, which is a freedom of information law lawsuit, is Chuck Weinstock versus Empire State Development, which is completely appropriate for the, what's going on. Um, he's been making demands and appealing those demands for almost two years now um, and gotten some stuff voluntarily and now considerably more stuff based on court orders saying that the excuses for withholding are not legitimate. And what we've gotten is fascinating already. A lot of communication showing a lot of extremely uh, cozy relationships between Vornado and ESD. And in fact, ESD acting as supplicant to Vornado in a number of instances. But beyond that, and that's, that's atmospheric and interesting, and it tells you about the culture of this whole deal and the smarminess and corrupt nature of it, not, even though not maybe technically corrupt, but it feels corrupt. The Now, most recently, we've gotten some drafts of a business plan from 2019, which is so, 2020, I believe. It's so favorable to Vernado, and it's unlike anything that has been announced, and apparently it is what was being planned. Now, Vernado's out of this now. So all of this is a little bit, is now um, abstract. It doesn't have any application anymore since... Vornado is simply out of, uh, while they, they want to keep this zombie GPP in place in order to keep the, over, the zoning override, which gives them enormous value in their sites, uh, they want to keep that on the books so they don't have to write down more the value of their properties and lose more stock price. They've lost 80% of their stock price in the last year in any event. So they want this zombie GPP, which we are still gonna to continue to litigate. In the, in the freedom of information law action, we found a lot of information, some of which you've referred to, which is the modeling of, e, uh, of Ernst & Young, which is not exempt if it was so-called final modeling. And we believe they're holding it back because it's embarrassing because it basically says, we can't tell you what this is gonna cost. And no one knows the office market is now in the toilet. We're, ne we're not going to be able to predict anything. The, the revenues out of these projects, if even if they were built, uh, are unpredictable. You might lose money, can't tell what the tax base would be. It is, there's so many variables going in so many directions that at least Vernado has now cut its losses. But of course, Vernado is a profit-making entity and all these other entities are government or quasi-government. So they don't care about profit. They just care. They know they can just tax you and me and go blithely about their way and claim that they're doing God's work. I, just, I think it's really important to point out that the block 780, which is the block that Layla showed in the presentation that's to the south, of Penn Station and where the proposed uh, Penn expansion would go. And that is an Amtrak driven plan with New Jersey Transit. Those new tracks and platforms would be for New Jersey Transit. 
those properties are not part of Vornado. Those are not Vornado owned. They're part of the GPP, but they are they do not have a developer attached to them, but the GPP still allows for that area to um, be upzoned outside of the current zoning laws according to the um, ESD GPP rules. I think, Felicia, it's interesting that you should point that out because there was a time when this thing was at its at its uh, fetal stages where Vornado promised to buy Block 780 for the government so it could develop it inconsistent with the GPP. That didn't happen, but that was originally conceptually part of a plan. Yeah, so I, I want to show the clip uh, where the governor announces that she is uh, going to decouple uh, the uh, the GPP, the general project plan, which is the, the, the real estate plan from uh, Penn Station. So are we able to uh, share this video? We are decoupling this from the prior plan, the GPP. That does not mean that we're not going to be building office space here at some point. It makes sense. We have 600,000 people come through here. It makes sense for them to be able to work in the same place where they commute to. So we'll get that done over time. But I no longer want that to be a delay, a delay to this process, which is moving forward today. Okay, so decoupling, in essence, she, the governor is uh, saying that now Vornado can do whatever they want, whenever they want. They don't, they're not even uh, bound by any particular timeline and the zoning stays. Uh, they can, you know, basically use these uh, zoning overrides at their leisure, at their convenience. Uh, my first question to you, Richard, is, is that even legal? I don't think so. And I think that that is more evidence of how the GPP is completely arbitrary and in that it, it's just being molded and 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 contorted into whatever political necessity is appropriate for the moment. But that's not even the most important part of it. The most important part of it is that uh, there's a lot of support legally for the proposition that a GPP has to be based on a, an EIS, an environmental impact statement. And this environmental impact statement no longer is applicable in any way, shape, or form that has been the underlying foundation for this GPP. It is completely different now. The purpose of this, of the current one, was to fund Penn Station, in part, in large part. And now, you have something that's decoupled, as she calls it. That's a nice word for abandoned. And and um, you do you decouple children? No, they're abandoned children, right? So the point is that um, this this child of hers is now in the wind, and it's Vornado's to use as it pretends it can see sees fit. But I don't know how they defend this at this point. We'll see. I'm sure we'll get papers with some. Uh, strange arguments about wh why this GPP remains in effect. I call it the zombie GPP because now it has no time. It has no uh, meaningful purpose. If unless they say the purpose is to fund uh, the entrances to a couple of subways and some widening sidewalks and a park or two, which does not require 18 million square feet and an override of city zoning. The city could very easily support that. City planning could very easily find ways to allow for real estate to support the kind of amenities that they want now that Jeep, that this Penn Station is no longer even a, 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 a you know, a, a, a veil of a reason for what this is all about. Uh, Felicia, um, I know that you wanted to make an additional uh, comment on on the uh, on the GPP, and I would love to hear your thoughts on on the governor's uh, decoupling. Well, I, I I wanted to make that point that Vornado is not attached as the developer to Block Seven Eighty, and so even if um, the GPP is is a zombie and is is in a um, semi dead state for a long period of time the risk of block 780 being demolished and being developed is is in no way over um I those agree. things are are on separate 
right. tracks. And as long as the GPP is still in place, um, that is still a distinct possibility. And although the state of New York says we don't do eminent domain, um, guess who does? The federal government. And guess who is um, part of the federal government? But, and but let me ask you a question, Felicia. Do, do you need the GPP? Can't they do, even if the GPP is abandoned, can't Amtrak and the federal government seize Block 780 and go forward with its plans as long as they do a NEPA study and and then go go through the eminent domain process. It, it, just, to, just to bring context for uh, for our viewers, NEPA is the federal environmental uh, review, which we all anticipate will be a, a process that will start when the expansion plan uh, is, is being developed. Uh, Felicia, what are your thoughts on uh, Richard's question? My understanding is that they need the GPP as a way to bypass the city uh, zoning laws and, and the city laws. And that because um, the GPP allows them to come in just as they did at, at Lincoln Center to, to tear down and build something new. And that I don't think that they're allowed to do that if it's just under the city law. Uh, there's probably somebody who can give a, a better, more fine pointed answer to that. But the other reason that they would want to keep the GPP in place for that particular block, as well as for block 781, which is the one across from Moynihan Station, is that it um, the GPP allows them to build higher than the city zoning laws. And the super tall towers were not just the Bornito Towers. The um, what is what was uh, projected to be built on block 780 are two towers as tall as the very tallest building of Hudson Yards on the corner of 31st Street and 7th Avenue and the corner of um, 31st Street and 8th Avenue. And in addition, um, mixed use, but still very tall, taller than the city zoning laws on um, the block of 781. Um, and they also, um, across the street on the corner was a Vornado property. Um, now, one thing that I wanna point out in addition about that is that those are planned uh, in exactly the same manner that 2PEN and MSG were planned. There will be a underground train station um, expansion where New Jersey Transit would be um, with, as uh, since you brought up the name Holly Light, what Holly defined as gracious entrances from the street down to the expanded station below. But all above, there would be no train hall. The entire above air rights would be for um, business and commercial. When there was some um, um, compromise to include a small amount of social service and a small amount of housing and affordable housing, those were slated not to be in the Vornado owned properties that are part of the GPP, but in the 780 and 781 areas, which again, do not have a developer attached to them, but is where Amtrak wants to have their expansion. So a few, few things that I can add on, on this. My understanding through the, uh, the number of meetings that we sat through uh, as part of the CACWAG, uh, Community, Community Advisory Committee Working Group, of which Felicia uh, had the pleasure of uh, being a member of, um, uh, from what I understood, um, the federal government has always been very reluctant to do eminent domain. And therefore, their preference was actually to have the state do it. And the GPP for the Block 780 and uh, you know, adjacent on East and West is actually uh, a, an alternative. And that alternative basically allows, if the Southern expansion is the preferred alternative through the federal uh, environmental review, basically dictates what would happen above grade. So the environmental review, the federal environmental review would concern what's below grade, uh, new tracks, a uh, new train station, it would be a, uh, you know, a terminal and not through running. Uh, and then it, they would, the, the feds would not determine what goes above, but it would be in this GPP that the design guidelines 
would be defined. Uh, but it would be up to the state to do the dirty work of eminent domain, uh, which then gives, uh, you know, puts uh, the, the residents uh, and the businesses who are in this area at great vulnerability um, and uh, gives them literally close to no protection. Uh, which, you know, has, has been a huge problem, you know, so, certainly for, I mean, for, for residents, I think it's pitiful. You, you, you get like, you know, the, the, some, some compensation that is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and for businesses, you basically get a check, I think of $7,000 and that's it. So, you know, let's say you're a, a restaurateur and you invested, uh, you know, half a million dollars in, you know, your, your, uh, restaurant great kitchen, uh, that's it. You know, it's too bad. <laughs> we'll pay for your move. And, and that's it. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's very important to keep in mind that, you know, even if uh, there is a decoupling, um, the vulnerability still remains. And uh, and the idea that something is dead, but actually not totally dead is exactly that, you know, it's it's a zombie. And I think that, you know, what, what we need is really for the GPP to be retired, not to be decoupled. And, uh, you know, I, I will, uh, you know, take the opportunity of this uh, panel to say that, you know, the elected officials uh, who were in attendance of, uh, of the press conference uh, seemed uh, pleased with the decoupling. And I think that we, we need to remind them that it is actually putting uh, this community, uh, businesses, residents, and also, you know, users of Penn Station in a very vulnerable position. And, uh, and that the decoupling is, is not a, um, an end uh, that, that is satisfactory. Um, moving on. Yeah, I was going to say that very quickly, the another risk with not a, not a, just a risk, but one thing that was not addressed in the governor's comments whatsoever is what is happening with the public realm task force that was announced to deal with the surface street level improvements. And mind you, those are all improvements that would be in direct benefit for Vornado. In addition to being able to build really tall, they'd also get all these extra amenities that would be in part state funded. Um, so there's there's no clarity on that at all. And there was gonna be the creation of a DevCo, a development corporation to finance that, that is partly um, city, partly state, uh, establish. So we have no clarity <laughs> on what's happening on the public realm now that the GPP has been decoupled. Um, so that's a missing piece here too, that we don't understand what the governor's announcement means for that. Yeah, very true. Very I do want to say that I, I understand the sense of urgency and the, the drive to try to simplify this process. As Richard was saying earlier, and, and others have said, there are a large number of agencies that are involved in this and it's very complicated and very confusing. There's no one driver of the project and we do need a new Penn Station. Penn Station is not acceptable from a transit user perspective. It is not okay to have our uh, commuters and our riders going through that station, which is not safe and is not, you know, is chronically has uh, delays, the signals don't work, the tracks are old, the platforms are dangerous, the wayfinding's a disaster. Um, there is a reason, and I can understand the impulse from the governor to try and segment and chunk out some of this. Just like with Gateway, we see some of the, you know, what is otherwise a $43 billion project. Okay, let's take it bit by bit. We gotta get those tunnels made. They've already been delayed for too long. However, it's got to still happen inside of a vision. And as Layla said earlier, are you really going to talk about building a seven to $10 billion station around MSG at the same time that you have the political potential of telling MSG they can't be there and freeing up the tracks and platforms so you can actually fix the transit itself? You know, th this is to me the political moment that is being missed. Yeah, 
very, very true. So um, we uh, want to make sure that uh, uh, people who are in attendance of uh, this event have an opportunity to speak. I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. Many, many of you are, are with us. It's really exciting to see uh, such a show of interest uh, for, for this program. Uh, you have the ability to use the Q&A function of, uh, of this webinar. Uh, some of you have already uh, dropped uh, questions. Um, I am going to uh, take some of them, but please continue to uh, to ask your questions uh, in the uh, in the Q and A, and we'll try to uh, answer uh, as many uh, as we can. Uh, one of the questions uh, is actually that the uh, the GPP is based on the lie that the neighborhood is at risk, uh, and that uh, those blocks are blighted. Uh, Richard, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, sorry, <laughs> my, sorry. The um, my thoughts are that blight is a very, very slippery um, concept that ESD relies on um, sometimes without ever really uh, demonstrating blight. There's a lot of judicial deference to their findings of blight um, that we contest. We say we've done a very careful study and found that arguably by their own standards, only 8% of the entire GPP project district is could even be characterized as blighted. And the worst building and the biggest one is an Amtrak building. Uh, and so blight here is a bit of a, um, a methodology for them to try and support again, their outcome rather than a cause for seeking to revamp or really um, uh, reconstruct something that needs to be taken care of because of blight. Um, and so it, it is a it is a, another example of an excuse, a pretext for going forward in favor of real estate rather than helping the station. It's there's nothing about if this is in class, in fact, by all accounts, by the National Historic Preservation uh, people, the trust, uh, an area which is could thrive with a great station, could be a, a wonderful area for, for artists and for culture and for with older buildings that are re, most of most of the great neighborhoods in, in downtowns in cities around this country now, let alone Soho and other neighborhoods like it in Brooklyn and the like, are old buildings or buildings where people are doing very interesting things with old buildings and classic architecture and preserving the, uh, the, the feeling of a neighborhood. The super talls destroy the feeling of a neighborhood. And so putting super talls in the place of what they claim is blighted just because it is pre-war or, or of some such nature is, is really short-sighted and undermines any sense of community that can grow up in that area. Yeah, I, actually, it's interesting to know that all the large tech companies uh, have their offices in historic buildings. Google, yes. Facebook, yes. Apple, they are all in historic buildings. And That's actually, so, some of them owned and operated by, by Vernado. Uh, you know, right. uh, Facebook is in the uh, the, the Farley portion of uh, this blog that has the Moynihan train hall, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the back of, uh, of this building is actually offices uh, that are uh, occupied by Facebook. And it goes to show that, you know, the, the history buildings are actually an asset and, uh, and, and not a liability. Who, who uh, wants to work in buildings where the windows can't open? I know. I know. So the next question, uh, we, we're getting uh, a number of questions about actually the uh, the method of operation of uh, ASTM. So they are what is known in the industry as a P3 uh, company, uh, public-private uh, partnership. And uh, if I understand their model correctly, they would uh, basically put $1 billion in equity, so their own money that they would invest in, in the project. Uh, some of it would be used for acquisition of uh, the, uh, the theater at Madison Square Garden, which is used to be known as the Hulu Theater. Um, then they would apply for a federal grant uh, and they would uh, be hoping to get $3 billion from uh, the, uh, the U.S. government 
Amendment, uh, a uh, RIF or TIFIA loan for those uh, of you who love these acronyms. And uh, they would also apply for a federal grant through FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, and they would be hoping to get 1.5 billion. And then the balance to their 6 billion uh, price tag would come in their, uh, you know, sort of like tabulation, uh, would come from uh, the state of New York. And it is important to note that the state of New York already have $1.3 billion appropriation for Penn Station, whether it is the reconstruction or the expansion, but, you know, dedicated, earmarked for Penn Station. And uh, that basically would be an excess uh, $800 million that could cover some uh, overcost. Um, and then how they would get their money in, they would basically have a 50-year concession. They would receive money from probably Amtrak, as Amtrak is the owner of uh, the station, but maybe from MTA or maybe from New Jersey Transit or maybe from all of the above. And in exchange, uh, they would uh, do a number of things. They would maintain the station and only the station. So anything at the platform level would not be their purview, but anything one tread on the step over the platform would be uh, their turf all the way to the concourse and all the way to the exits and the uh, egress of, uh, of the station. Um, they would repay the loan with the, the money that they would get and they would get their profit. And uh, they are uh, anticipating that this business model would generate eight to 11% return on their investment, which we're told is standard for the industry. Once again, as Rachel said in, in her uh, comment previously, we haven't seen a full budget analysis. And what I'm saying is just numbers and it is not an analysis. We very much look forward to really being able to dig deeper and have much more detail. But just with this preliminary uh, you know, information that we have, uh, Rachel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to add that the the payment that it, it's a concession model, right? So they would do some upfront costs, but then the state, the MTA, Amtrak, New Jersey Transit would have to pay them. And I think the number that was reported was 250 million annually. And you said that that's over, you know, 50 years. So, you know, and I think the other thing to note on the the, the loan that they would get they could only get that loan through the P3. They can't get that as a private entity. They are not eligible to apply for federal dollars uh, or federal loans that way. And the MTA and the state can apply for that loan as well with or without the private um, P3 um, piece. Um, you know, as a watchdog, um, I'm a little concerned about these types of proposals where, you know, you don't have to pay, we'll take care of it. Um, generally, these models are used in a situation where the state does not have the capital, does not have the money, and uh, state or whatever entity, they don't have the money to front to do the capital work. But as you said, the state has already appropriated three, 1.3 billion. And if you look at this share, the $7 billion number from ESD and the MTA, the share to New York State of that is only 1.75 million billion. Sorry, <laughs> these are important distinctions. So we're very close to the state share in the MTA um, ESD kind of seven billion dollar number. Anyway, it's not actually a lot more for the state to have to kick in. So I think functionally, you're looking at um, you know payments over 50 years to ASTM, or you're looking at the state having to front just a little bit more now. And I think when you're talking about uh, the state doing bonding, um, these things have to be approved um, by the bond regulators. I think it's a process that is more familiar. It's a process where I think it can be a bit more transparent to do it in a more traditional um, bonding mechanism than a P3 formation. Yeah, moving on, we have lots of questions. Um, one thing that we haven't, we we have talked a lot about, you know, the money, what would go around Penn Station. The one thing we haven't talked uh, so much about is actually the operations and, uh, you know, how much would it cost to build this expansion is actually based on uh, the, the premise 
that we need an expansion. And lots are actually saying that we don't need an expansion because there are other ways to actually increase the capacity, meaning the ability to bring more trains in Penn Station if we implement through running. So Felicia, this is very much your, your area of, uh, of expertise. Um, are we missing uh, out yet again on an opportunity to actually truly improve uh, Penn Station, but not only making it prettier or you know, improving the, uh, the customer experience as they say these days, but actually as making it uh, a, a more effective way to move people through the region? Yeah, I mean, um, at Tri-State Transportation, we are um, advocates and proponents of through running and of uh, reorganizing our patchwork of regional and national rail into a, an effective regional rail line. And we, we have a great report that um, my former colleague, Liam Blank, wrote a few months ago that you can find on our website. Um, the idea would be to have true connectivity across the region and to break out of the silos that we're in. Um, earlier, it was talked about how expensive the um, east side access or uh, Grand Madison um, expansion was. First of all, those were real tunnels and real stations that were built. That's more expensive than um, you know just a redesign of the lipstick on the pig of Penn Station. Um, but secondly, because LIRR and Metro North Rail couldn't come to an agreement about track sharing, um, they had to build the new tracks uh, in a whole new station far, far underground, which was dramatically more expensive. And for people who have used the new station, while it brings many benefits to our region, um, it's very far <laughs> Is it, what is it, seven stories underground that you have to travel by escalator? It takes 12 minutes to walk to it. Um, what we need, and one of the things that the Community Advisory Committee um, advised at the end of the CACWAC process was that there should be one authority that is overseeing this whole process to organize, to bring all the parties into the room and to say, you, you guys can't be fighting about track contracts or being afraid about losing access to the tracks when. Metro North comes in that LIRR won't be able to use the tracks. Everybody needs to play together. We need to look holistically and rationally at how we need to move people from place A to place B. And it's not about each individual agency. Um, and, and that includes Amtrak because they really are the 800 pound gorilla in the room in terms of, you know, by the way, they have through running, you know, their trains run through. So they really don't care very much about if New Jersey Transit is going to have a stub in terminal, which is something that um, nobody in the international rail community has been building for 30 years. You know, they don't care because they get to run their trains through. Um, New Jersey Transit needs to stand up for itself and needs to say, no, we need a new rail yard. We need to be able to move our trains through. Let's have connectivity between Long Island and New Jersey and all the way across and open up our economic expansion model and development model far beyond just the central business district in the Penn Station area. So we're getting lots of questions about, you know, what can people do? And uh, that sort of also ties to, uh, you know, how can we influence? It is in the end, a political situation. It is a situation of governance. It is a situation of policy. It is a situation of fiscal decisions that basically are in the hands of, you know, those folks that we call politicians, elected officials, you know, those people we put in office. How can we help them make the right decisions and what kind of political process uh, you can point to for those who are on this, uh, you know, listening to this, uh, this program, uh, what can they do? Who should they call? Rachel, maybe I'm gonna throw this one at you. Oh, wow. It's a big one because there's a lot of players, as have been said. And I mean, I think that there isn't really a public comment period anymore. You know, ESD's GPP has been approved. There's not a public comment period. The MTA isn't having a public comment period. So I think it really comes back to your elected officials who represent the area and telling them what is important to you, especially your state representatives. Um, and I think it's also a matter of 
getting the right issues <laughs> discussed and talking about them the right way. I think one thing that concerns me is that whenever we see these presentations from the governor, from ASTM, from anyone, we're looking at, there's often such a discussion of the visual, <laughs> the pretty glass, let's open up the light. It's, it's not a discussion about how is this gonna impact, impact us as residents of the district, as taxpayers, as MTA riders, as Amtrak riders, New Jersey Transit riders. So folks need to know that there's not just a concern about, you know, how does it look, but how, it'll, how will it affect us um, in all those different ways? And I, I think it really does come back to your, um, your state legislators at the moment, um, I, very I, much I, though. Let me add to that and say that the one person who I think could actually, actually solve this um, Gordian knot, which is a very kind way of, of describing the mess that we're in, um, has too much on his plate probably to get it done, and that's Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer is the is the consummate retail politician, knows New York City inside out, knows all the players, and has all the power to deal with this exact problem. And I don't think he's focused on it at all, really. Uh, he's very interested in the infrastructure bill. He got it. He shepherded it through, which is a big part of what's going to pay for this ultimately, if it ever gets paid for. And it and it's too bad. The other, the other big factor here, which it seems to me people could do something about in some sense, is um, at the uh, is is right now militate for the non-approval of the Madison Square Garden special permit, unless Madison Square Garden cooperated in this process over the next short period of time. They have a, a huge tax exemption and they have a special permit. Both things are in jeopardy here and they, and yet, and they have a terrible reputation politically. Dolan has forfeited any sense of identification with the public. He's alienated everybody uh, very effectively. Uh, and this is the time to jump on him when he's weak and his teams are losing. Uh, and so uh, as much as people need to go to the garden to see their teams and their concerts, um, it would be time to, for, for some kind of grassroots move to put pressure on Dolan to cooperate in this process. Because if Madison Square Garden is not, not gonna be moved, as, as, as Felicia said, this is lipstick on a pig. We're never gonna have platforms that are open enough. They're always gonna be uh, these huge pillars that have to support Madison Square Garden right next to the, where the people have to get off the train and never providing enough space for the people to get off the train safely. And when, if Madison Square Garden goes, it, it really does provide the opportunity to do a magnificent station. But Madison Square Garden has a huge vested interest in this, in staying where they are. And unless they're given a lot of incentive to leave and a lot of disincentive to stay, they will stay. Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, it's in the stars are almost perfectly aligned for something great to happen, which is why I think that, you know, we we need to keep pushing. We need to keep having these these uh, panels and the, the, these discussions. Um, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that the City Planning Commission is going to vote on July 12th, which is literally in two weeks, on the special permit. So now is the time. Although the uh, you know the public hearing has concluded, the commissioners are still accepting testimony, and that your testimony can be very simple. I oppose the renewal of the special permit. That's all you have to say. Don't make it complicated. They need to hear that you are opposed to the renewal of this special permit and certainly in perpetuity. Um, the other thing that is going to happen as soon as the city uh, planning commission votes on this, then it will be in the hands of the city council. 
And the city council is made up of 50 council members and they all have a vote. And although typically there is deference given to the local council member, and in this case, it's council member Eric Botcher, it is possible that other council members in the city would like to actually have uh, their the voice heard. I think everyone is hoping that uh, council member Botcher understands that the special permit cannot be issued in perpetuity, shall not be issued in perpetuity. He has made uh, those comments uh, and has said that stated that he uh, his position his you know starting position is that he believes MSG must move. So this is very encouraging. At the same time, he needs to be given the political uh, strength by support of this position. So we need to write letters and not only to him but to the entire council, including the speaker who obviously holds a, a lot of power, as well as the chair of the land use committee of the city council. And this is council member uh, Salamanca. So we're gonna actually put all of that in an email and I'll send an email blast and please go to our, our website and you know sign up if you're not re re receiving our emails uh, yet so that you can uh, you know keep uh, in, you know we can keep you in, in the loop. But this advocacy is gonna be very important. One thing that is very effective is actually calling your council member or calling your state elected official. This is something that really, really, makes an impact. So pick up the phone. Um, we will also have all this information, you know, the emails for uh, all the council members, their phone numbers, and also call the governor. You know, she made an announcement on Monday. Let's give her a call and let's tell her that, you know, we're not really buying this whole decoupling and that what we want is for the GPP to be retired. It needs to be dead and cremated. It cannot continue to linger. It cannot be something that, you know, as Richard said, is a zombie that can come back from the dead and uh, is actually really very uh, dangerous. Um, the uh, We can also so encourage uh, state legislators to hold uh, uh... Uh, hearings. Uh, as uh, both Rachel and uh, Felicia uh, know, those are actually very effective. And uh, we're very fortunate that uh, the um, the state senator who has oversight over uh, ESD is uh, Senator Leroy Cumry. He's been very focused on this issue. He's been uh, very, very uh, interested in uh, getting a better plan. Uh, he is very opposed to the GPP. He hasn't been shy about uh, saying that much, and uh, we need to encourage him to maybe uh, hold another hearing uh, so that we can actually uh, bring ESG and, uh, you know, have them answer uh, those uh, important questions. So I think that in terms of advocacy, there, there's a number of things that we can continue to do. We we know that you know it's um it it it's a long fight. Uh, it requires a lot of stamina, and uh, I know that you know many of you who are on this call tonight, um, you know, have been in the trenches, uh, appeared at these hearings, spoken, uh, attended rallies, press conferences, and and the likes. But they, as much as you know, they are exhausting. I I know uh, they are actually really critical, and uh, and they. They, they do make an impact. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so we've been asked if there is a template to submit testimony. We're going to actually put that in an email. Once again, it can be very, very simple. Um, let me see. I'm actually going through the, uh, the Q&A. Um, so we did talk about uh, through running. Um, I think Felicia, if, if there are any resources that you want to point people to, I think that the um, uh, the policy document that Tri-State Transportation Campaign uh, issued uh, when was it last year, a couple of years ago, on through running is is probably a very good place to start. Our regional rail report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find our regional rail report on our website tstc.org. And um, it's it's very good. It's it's simple reading. It, you don't have to be a technical whiz um, to get through it. And it, it makes the case for how we can work together as a region um, seamlessly and the, the role that through running plays in that. Yeah. 
Uh, great. Well, we are getting close to uh, the uh, the conclusion of uh, of this event. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to note something that you know in in the process of this uh, this you know long fight, uh, I have found uh, really astounding is that um, we have really built a coalition that is extremely diverse with uh, you know, people from very, very different fields, uh, transportation, good government, uh, historic preservation, uh, urban design, uh, some lawyers, some economists, uh, and of course, a very, very strong community, residents, businesses, uh, small property owners, uh, tenants. Uh, you know, it's really astounding to see this coalition continuing to work together. And I really want to, uh, you know, thank all of you for, you know, sticking together, staying together. Uh, and uh, I think it is really a testament to the great organizing power of New York. And, uh, you know, I have to say that three years ago, we were really in a uh, sad and, uh, and very scary place. And uh, today, I think that we are in a much, much better place. Not to say that the fight is over, but, you know, we are uh, supported by amazing people. I want to thank Richard uh, for the terrific uh, legal work that, uh, you know, has gone into fighting this horrendous plan. And, uh, you know, this organizing is really remarkable. So on these words, I want to turn it back to uh, our wonderful speakers uh, for some uh, closing comments, maybe starting with you, Felicia. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and Layla for your um, tremendous efforts around this. And in particular, um, one of the things I appreciate is that you're not looking for one specific solution. You're looking for a solution that works for the region, the city, the neighborhood. And I think that's, um, again, to pull, pull the lens back. That's what we all need. And it doesn't have to be so difficult. This has been done around the world. You know, we know how to build train stations. We know how to build trains. This is not a new technology, although it has been modernized and it needs to be brought up into 21st century code. Um, the, the key is for the people to tell their elected officials, please do open that email and write to them and let them know you really care about this and you want transit first and you want neighborhood first and city first. And um, if enough people write, they really will have to listen. Uh, we don't have to be cynical. Um, you know, ye yesterday was primary day and there was such a small turnout. And that that is sad. What we need is all of these people with all these great opinions and ideas bring them forward, bring them to your elected officials, make sure they know how much you care and that you're going to vote based on this issue. And if they want your vote, they've got to go your way. Thank you, Felicia. Um, Rachel. Well, thanks again, Layla. I really appreciate this. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. And a few of you, or many of you are still here, I'm seeing. Um, I. One thing I didn't touch on that I want to do a little bit is I didn't really talk about MSG. And, and um, I think that it's interesting on a couple of levels. People ask, well, what should I do? How should I organize? Um, it's up to the state of New York to get rid of their tax break. It's $43 million a year. Um, the state budget, actually, the state Senate proposed taking that money and giving it to the MTA. Um, that issue is it's in perpetuity right now in state law. It should not be that way, no way. The same way that the permit should not be in perpetuity, nor should the $43 million a year tax break for MSG. So I think that's something to keep organizing around. And um, unfortunately I saw an article saying that ASTM said, oh, we shouldn't try to extract anything out of MSG through this, you know, the tax break, the permit process is not the appropriate time Yes, it is. <laughs> I think it's absolutely the right time. Um, so I would just say that um, encourage folks and remind them that that is a state policy to take city taxpayer dollars away, um, same as the GPP. So um, wanted to focus on that a little bit and thank everybody for tuning in and thank Richard and Felicia and Layla for all of your work. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Richard. 
Yeah, uh, I guess the first thing I'd like to say is that it is such a more than a breath of fresh air. It's a, it's a watershed moment that Layla has taken over the city club and run with this and so many other issues. Layla's leadership is amazing. Look at the organization of this webinar. It's just remarkable. Your presentation at the outset was so beautifully coherent in bringing all these disparate factors into focus, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, many of them are outside the litigation, and I'm more familiar with the litigation aspects of this than I am much of what uh, Felicia and Rachel, Rachel and I talk a good deal because she's helped us enormously in providing a lot of the fundamentals behind our litigation. But hearing Felicia talk is also incredibly helpful and gives us all a perspective. And perspective is what we need because this is all about politics now. And the politics destroys perspective because everybody's looking for their own opportunity to take advantage of a situation. The most recent example, which we didn't even talk about, was the compatibility study, or I call it the incompatibility study. That was just a political document. That was a, a clarion call by Jana Lieber pulling together the railroad saying that Madison Square Garden is essentially incompatible with a proper Penn Station, because it was built for 200,000 people, as Felicia said, and it's servicing six or 700,000 now. And that was just one example. But you don't hear Governor Hochul saying now that it's incompatible. She's now talking about plans that I think, at least subtextually, assume that Madison Square Garden is going to stay. And that that itself is crazy, right? I mean, that. The, it should be an open discussion, in other words. It's not something that we should be preordaining in one way or the other. So politics is the enemy of what we have to face here. And Layla has really transcended the politics in bringing people together to talk about this. And I think that's incredibly important. And I wish we could find somebody in a position of more power than any of us and even the people watching this um, to transcend politics and make and, and provide a clarion call. I mean, if, Kirst, if Kirsten Gillibrand had one bone of, of uh, power, of, of aspiration in her body, then maybe we, she could do it. But we, Chuck Schumer is the obvious one to do it, but he has too much going on. It's, it's just impossible for him to, I think, take this on. I wish he would. He's He's magnificent when he takes something on. Um, anyway, my message to the group is we have to figure out how to put all these disparate, at least six political powers with their political uh, aspirations and, and posturing aside and figure out a plan that serves New Yorkers and serves people who use these stations and is as magnif magnificent as the McKimmon Mead, which preceded it and which was torn down in 1963, um, in, a, in the tragic short sightedness of, of stupidity that city planning sometimes inflicts upon us. So someone had suggested and uh, that we should organize uh, the, the the Penn Station train, and we should basically load all our federal elected officials in Washington DC in a train and tell them you have until you get into Penn to fix it. Uh -huh. And we will not disembark until we, we have a solution. I think that you know bringing, bringing people in, talking, having these discussions is really going to be key. I don't wanna to say too much about what the next project, next program is going to be for the city club, but stay tuned because uh, we may have uh, some breaking news uh, coming your way. Uh, if it happens, it will be uh, the week of uh, July 10th. Um, and that will be uh, you know, a qu quite an exciting uh, conversation. Um, and you know, stay tuned, make sure that you register, you get our emails. Um, the city club, 
Club of New York, as you know, is a non-for-profit organization. Please go to our website. Please uh, hit the donate button. Uh, we cannot uh, run this uh, organization without funds. We rely entirely on uh, donations and contributions. They are uh, fully tax deductible. So uh, please don't be shy. Um, I want to thank the panelists tonight, uh, great speakers who are with us tonight, Felicia, Rachel, Richard, thank you so much for your insights, for your knowledge, for your integrity, and for your advocacy. I want to thank uh, members of the public, members of the City Club for joining us tonight. You were really numerous joining us and you stayed with us. We really appreciate that. Continue to follow what we're doing. And I wish you all a very good night.